What's going on, you guys? Welcome back to the Neighborhood Podcast. I'm one half the podcast. My name is Kyle Dabra. What's going on, everybody? The other half here, Kevin Valentin. Kyle, what's going on, my boy? Not much, man. Had a nice Memorial Day weekend and just ready to get to the episode, man. Absolutely. Definitely a busy, busy weekend this week in the, excuse me, this weekend in the NBA, of course. A lot of these series going back and forth. I mean, Kyle's got the agenda, but I'm just sitting here looking at these games projected for tomorrow, and I'm just, I'm in shock, man. A lot of these series are going in directions I would have never predicted. So, Kyle, what, 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 what are we talking about today? Sure. Uh, like you mentioned, we'll definitely talk about the games that we have for Tuesday in a little bit. But just going down the list here, we'll start with Anthony Davis. Uh, he suffered a groin injury in game four between the Lakers and the Suns. Uh, he did not come back in that game and the Lakers ended up losing that game. So that series is now tied 2-2 as game five goes back to Phoenix. Also, we'll talk about um, Coach Mike Malone for the Denver Nuggets. He called out his starters uh, in a post-game press conference after game four, after they got pretty much beat down by the Trailblazers in embarrassing fashion in game four. So we'll definitely dive into that a little bit and how it affects the the Denver Nuggets going into game five of that series. Like I mentioned, we'll talk about the predictions for the Tuesday games in the NBA. Set some time aside for a rant from Kevin about the Dallas Mavericks. They have not been playing well in the last two games of their series. So I'll leave some time aside for Kev to just let his feelings be known. I think this will be a little bit of therapy for him. I think him getting all these emotions out will definitely be better for him than just internalizing them. And then also I gave to, Kyle a sample size and he had to cut me off because we had to start recording. So <laughs> these feelings will be heard, ladies and gentlemen. And then to wrap up the episode, uh, we'll talk about the New York Knicks. Um, they're currently down 3-1 in the series against Atlanta. Atlanta has looked very impressive in the last two games of the series that they played in Atlanta. So we'll talk about that series for a little bit. And then we'll talk a little bit about Boston and Br- Brooklyn series. Uh, Brooklyn is up 3-1 in their series. Uh, They looked very impressive in game four. I believe Kevin Durant, James Harden, and Kyrie Irving all combined to score over 100 points collectively, which is quite impressive for a big three to just dominate a game offensively in that manner. So we'll talk about that series a little bit and whether or not that we believe that that series is over. But like I said at the, the start of the episode, We'll talk about Anthony Davis and just the impact that his absence could bring to the Lakers in game five back in Phoenix. So, Kev, let me let me get your impression or your opinion on how Anthony Davis's absence could be a major factor going into game five for the Lakers. I mean, it, it's absolutely crucial. It's it's mind blowing that, you know, he's he's hurt yet again. It seems like the, the Lakers have kind of gone through the ringer in terms of injuries throughout this season and you know you kind of hoped for health throughout the entire postseason from their two stars in LeBron James and Anthony Davis and then AD goes down with a groin injury and we know what that can do to a player of that caliber or should I say you know of of any caliber LeBron James was out for the majority of last season or what was it two seasons ago that was it his first season in LA two seasons ago yeah yeah he missed about 25 27 games something of that manner and it makes a very big difference. And Anthony Davis now having a lot less time to heal. Granted, Braun had pretty much the entire regular season when he got hurt. But the Lakers were out of the postseason at that point. So Anthony Davis is a very, very, very big piece. And him getting hurt, especially at this time where you're going back to Phoenix. Phoenix being, a, I, would, I wouldn't say on a roll, but they did steal one in L.A. And it, the series is tied. This is, this is imperative for the Lakers to have to come out here and win this game tomorrow. I mean, if, if the Lakers lose this game, Anthony Davis is going to have to come back in game six, and he's going to have to pop off. There's no guarantee that Anthony's ruled out for this next game, but based off of what I've been seeing off of reports and what I know about that groin injury, he's either going to be significantly limited or he's definitely going to be out because there, there's absolutely no shot he plays in this game, in my opinion. That means Drummond's got to step up. Kyle Kuzma's got to step up. The Morris brothers has to step up. I always forget which Morris brothers on each team. It's just a force of habit. It's Markeith. Yeah, so Markeith has got to step up and so on and so forth. I mean, LeBron James, I believe a reporter asked him today, are his shoulders 
uh, still big enough to handle carrying a team on his back at this age at age 38. And I believe that he should be fine. 36. Sorry. I don't know my brain. I'm so angry with Dallas right now. I got numbers all jambled and, and all messed up. So please excuse my inaccuracy today, but LeBron James has got to be able to, 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 Oh, I'm looking at 38 minutes. That's why I saw the number. It is what it is. Um, LeBron's going to be able to carry this team, but the team itself is also have to step up last game. I'm literally looking at this stat sheet. It's pitiful. Just absolutely disgusting. Dennis Schroeder, eight points, Wesley Matthews, six points. Andre Drummond had five points and LeBron had to carry the low with 25 and 12. So we're sitting here just looking down this, this, this box score, just where's the help going to come from? I mean, who, who's going to be able to step up? Is Marcus all going to have to start in his place? Is Montrez Harrell going to have to come out here and, and do something? Cause he, what did he play five minutes? Kyle, I don't know the significance. Is it an injury or is it a coach's decision that Montrez has not been playing? It's a matchup issue. So does this mean that, that uh, Vogel is going to have to play Montrez Harrell? I don't know because all I know is DeAndre Ayton is looking at this and saying, oh, my God, barbecue chicken. Because the Andre Drummond the Lakers have is not the Andre Drummond that we are all know and love from the Piston days, let alone the Cavalier days because he was kind of eating in Cleveland too. So I'm thinking if Anthony Davis doesn't play this game, LeBron James is going to have to average or at least put up anywhere from 30, 10, and 10, 30, 12, and 12 for the Lakers to have a single chance. And we're going to have to have somebody step up, whether that be Dennis Schroeder, Andre Drummond, or Kyle Kuzma. Someone has to help him out because the Phoenix Suns are playing very good team basketball. I believe in this game, they had about six players in double figures. They had Jamison Crowder with 17, Bridges with 11, Aiton with 14, Chris Paul with 18, Devin with 17, and then Cameron Payne with another 13 points. So they're spreading the ball out relatively evenly, and they're all getting good looks. So I would probably say that the Lakers are going to have to have at least two players step up alongside LeBron James to help to replace the impact that Anthony Davis would have. So I'm a little concerned for LA in this regard, because again, they are going back to Phoenix. Anthony Davis, we all know is going to be more than likely missing this game. And history does stand on the side of game five, usually is the winner of the majority of series in NBA history. So I hope that the Lakers find a way to sweep this out, but I wouldn't be surprised if Phoenix comes out with an upset, depending on how the Lakers bench produces, or should I say the Lakers role players produce. I agree. I think his absence, speaking of Anthony Davis's potential absence in game five, I think it could be significant because it's like you mentioned, I think DeAndre Ayton's going to look at that matchup of potentially going up against either Andre Drummond or Marc Gasol. And I think he's going to exploit that matchup to his advantage. And I think he's going to probably have probably another 15 plus rebound gain. It wouldn't surprise me if he gets closer to 15, 20 points because he has been eating down low. He's shooting over like 80% in this series. So not only is he getting good looks from the field, granted he's mostly beholden to scoring down low, but he's making the most of it. And I just don't know if the Lakers defense is going to be able to really withstand that pressure that Aiton can bring if Anthony Davis is not on the court in game five for the Lakers. And it's like you mentioned, with Anthony Davis potentially being out for game five, you're going to have to see some guys step up here. We just saw Montrezl Harrell for the first time in the series in game three. Excuse me, uh, game four. Four. So I don't know whether or not that he's going to have a more focal point of being in the offense. I don't know what his defensive presence is going to be because he is kind of more of – he's kind of a guy that I've always kind of thought of is he gets the team going. The energy he brings to the court is infectious, and he's really the, the kind of guy that I think could really get a team going on a run if he's kind of the spark to go along with that. I think LeBron needs to step up in a major way. I think when I look at this series, he has been what I would say rather passive. I think it may have something to do with the ankle a little bit. He's still being effective, but I think he's going to have to more have more of a prominent role in this game. If the Lakers are going to be competitive to possibly win this game five in Phoenix. And we're going to have to see Andre Drummond step up to what he used to play. Like he was in Detroit, like you mentioned. Um, I think he's still getting comfortable with the system that LA is currently running and there may just be some small chemistry issues, but he's going to have a big game and all in all, I think 
do you, they have to limit the turnovers. They had a lot of turnovers in game four. They I believe they turned the ball over 15 times. And there were some really inopportune turnovers that really caused them to lose the game in game four. So I think they're going to have to focus on playing lockdown defense as best as they can against freaking DeAndre and Chris Paul, Devin Booker. And then you got to watch out for guys like Jay Crowder and possibly Mikhail Bridges as well. These guys can knock down shots and if they get hot, it puts the Lakers in a bind here. So all in all, I think the Lakers can manage to possibly squeak out a game in Phoenix if they play their cards right. But that would probably entail LeBron scoring probably 30 plus them probably forcing Phoenix to turn the ball over at least 10 to 15 times, probably closer to 15 in my mind. And the Lakers are going to have to get solid bench production from Caruso, Kuzma, and possibly guys like freaking Ben McLemore and Markeith Morris. So there's definitely some pressure here for the Lakers. And oh, yeah. it's all dependent on whether or not AD can play. I think if he plays, he will be limited. I don't know how many minutes he would play because that groin injury can be a lingering one. And if he doesn't play, then everybody's got to step up here. And it's going to be quite a game five, even if AD is on the court or not for the Lakers. I think it's still going to be a pretty competitive game in my mind, though. You know, the series has definitely shown us that the Phoenix Suns are for real. I mean, granted, the, the Lakers being the seventh seed, we've said a multitude of times, they're not a true seventh seed. They're only the seed they are because of the injuries they've had throughout the regular season. Mm -hmm. But Phoenix is matching up toe for toe, blow for blow. None of these games have been blowouts. I think, well, game three was a little bit of a, of a stretch. I think I did predict. I did predict that one. I said it was going to win by 10, 15 points. Yeah, you were right. So, I mean, they won so, by I mean it, 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 just, it got away from Phoenix and LA just continued to pile it on. But nevertheless, as a whole, the series has been relatively good. And, you know, seeing a star player like Anthony Davis go down the way that he did with the groin injury, it's just, it's upsetting because you do want to see not just the Lakers win, at least in my opinion. I definitely want to see a good series. I want to see them go blow for blow. I want to see them go shot for shot. I want to see a series go seven games. I want to see LeBron James show, hey, if I want to be in this GOAT talk, I got to be able to carry this team. So, and not to mention, this is Devin Booker's first postseason. So anytime Devin Booker's on TV, he's must watch television. He just had a bad night from the field, five of 14. But, you know, hopefully he bounces back. And Chris Paul seemed to be dealing with that shoulder injury a little bit better this game. So, you know, game five is tomorrow in Phoenix. And uh, I just hope that it's a good game all in all. Anthony Davis, I would hope he doesn't play to re-aggravate that injury. But for uh, all intents and purposes, it's definitely going to be a good one. So, I mean, other than that, um, to transition into the next segment, which would be the Mike Malone comments post game about calling his starters quote unquote soft. Um, Kyle, what are your thoughts on Mike's approach in that post game conference? You did, did you think that that was appropriate for the younger team that he has? Do you think that that was necessary to maybe get a little bit of a rise out of them? What, what, what are your thoughts? I think it was, I don't think it was out of bounds for him to say that because the nuggets played like trash in that game four against the nuggets. They got absolutely it's the Blazers run off the court. The Blazers had a fantastic performance against the Nuggets. I mean, when you look down the freaking box score here, you had CJ McCollum. He dropped 21 points. Nurkic had a great game. He had 17. Norman Powell absolutely went off in that game, almost had 30 just by himself. Damian Lillard didn't even have that good of a game. He only scored 10 points. Granted, he did get 10 assists as well. But just all in all, the Nuggets just – got the brakes beat off of them in game four. I think it definitely demanded some sort of response from Michael Malone. Look, Michael Malone has been a very solid coach for the Denver Nuggets so far. He was able to lead that team to the Western Conference Finals last year, had an impressive coaching performance for being, for being able to lead that team back from a 3-1 deficit against the Clippers last year. And even despite this year, this year has been a little bit different because now Jamal Murray – is not playing because he tore his ACL a couple months ago. This team is still pretty competitive. And this, this team has been able to rise to the challenge of trying to replace a very dominant player in their system. Trying to replace Jamal Murray is not an easy task, but Michael Porter Jr. has stepped up, but he did not step up in game four. He had a terrible game. 23 minutes, he scored three points. Nikola Jokic, who's possibly the MVP for the NBA this year. He scored 16 points. 
And when I'm just looking at how this game transpired from quarter to quarter, look, they were at least competitive in the first half, but in the second half, the Nuggets outscored, excuse me, the Blazers outscored the Nuggets by 17 points in the third quarter. The Trailblazers scored 36 points to Denver's 19 in the third quarter. It was just, it got absolutely away from them in the in the third quarter. Great that Denver did kind of make some sort of a little comeback in the fourth, but at that point, the game was largely over just because Portland was just playing that well. And I think the reason why he kind of went after them a little bit, specifically with the starters, is because they're going to have to bring the intensity for game five. Granted, game five is in Denver. They will have somewhat of a crowd in Denver just because Denver has limited capacity in their arena. But they're going to need these guys to step up. Michael Porter is a lot better than three points. Nikola Jokic is better than 16 and nine. So it's going to be a very interesting lead up to this game just because I think Portland is going to have a lot of confidence going into this game after what they were able to do against Denver in game four. And that's despite Damian Lillard having a bad game. You get Dame in a game five situation where there's a lot of pressure on the line. I think Damian could, raise, could, Damian could rise to the occasion. And Denver's going to have to contend with that. And that is no easy feat. So, granted, I know the Nuggets are the three seed here. But they are going up against a very competitive six seed. And I'll tell you what, after this game four, I think Portland may smell a little blood in the water here. And if the Nuggets aren't careful, this game five could get out of hand for them. You are spot on. I agree 130%. The fact that we're literally sitting here looking at the starters, none of them played more than 30 minutes. This game was a blowout from the third quarter on. It was absolutely Mm -hmm. atrocious. I'm circling on one particular player, and that's Aaron Gordon. You went out and got Aaron Gordon from the trade deadline from Orlando for Denver, and he's given you absolutely – Little to no points. I mean, he's been giving you 13 here, 15 here. He had six points, and he was negative 30 in the plus minus. Absolutely atrocious. I get it. It's a box score that doesn't reflect necessarily how well he played or how bad he played. But we're just sitting here. We're just looking at the numbers. This is all I have in front of me to go off of, and that's just terrible. Granted, Jokic had negative 32, and that's supposedly the favorite for the MVP this year. So, Yes, Michael Malone's comments were 100% necessary. This is a young team. This is a very inexperienced postseason team, excluding Nikola Jokic and Austin Rivers and Paul Millsap. Everybody else in this team has little to no postseason experience. He needs to find some way to wake them up. Michael Porter Jr. obviously has been a very big X factor for this team going forward throughout the entire season. And you're going to sit here and tell me you only took three total shots and made three points, 23. No, absolutely not. And as Kyle stated, Dame had a horrible night and you lost by 20 on your home court, or excuse me, you were, you were away. Excuse me. You were in Portland. They're going to their home court next game. There's absolutely no excuse for Denver. If Dame has an average night, they lose this game by 30 plus. Like Mm -hmm. this is, this is bad. You lost to Norman Powell. Let No disrespect to Norman Powell. He was a trade acquisition from the Toronto Raptors this season. But you let Norman Powell go 11 to 15 from the field, score 29 points. Damian Lillard had 10. Yeah. To me, that screams no defense. Mm-hmm. To me, that screams no effort. CJ McCollum, 9 of 19. Damian Lillard, 1 of 10. Robert Covington, three of six. You literally lost to Norman Powell. Carmelo Anthony was five of 11 with 12 points. Like, they need to do better. There, there really is no other words. There's, there's no other support cast. There's no other system that I can, no other idea I can really give out that's going to say, you know, Denver has a shot. No, 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 no. They need to step up and they need to play basketball. They're the three seed. Nikola Jokic is an MVP favorite. You have great role players right next to you. And again, like Kyle stated, Jamal Murray is out this season with that with that torn ACL. But they have the potential to beat them. I don't think the missing piece of Jamal Murray is enough for the Denver Nuggets to lose this bad. They need to step it up. They need to show more intensity. And they need to play better basketball. Because if they're going to play even a shrivel of 
anything of this game in the next game, I, I think Portland, like Kyle said, definitely smells blood in the water. There is no excuse for them to have played as poorly as they did. And none of their starters, the, the, the fact that their starters didn't even play 30 minutes literally just shows Malone pulled them and said, yo, we don't even got this. Like everybody else go in this game. Like there's no point. If Denver doesn't step up, Jokic doesn't play like Jokic, and Michael Porter Jr. has another soft night, this series will be wrapped up in six games relatively quickly because if Portland takes game five and you go to Portland on a t- basically a two-game win streak in Portland, no shot. That, that, it's over. It's game time, son. Like the, guy, the man has said so many times, there's, I, I'm tired of being disrespected. I'm tired of not getting the credit I deserve. This is what I'm here for. Game time is coming, and Denver better wake up because if, if they're not ready for it, it's a wrap. Yeah. So I'm just – I'm worried about the fact that, that if you're a Nuggets fan, like you said, they got blown out and Dame only scored 10. Dame could go out in game five and drop 30 on them. Like Easy. nothing. Like nothing. So, look, Portland may be – I don't know what's going to happen in this series. This is one of those series that still has the potential to go seven games. I wouldn't put it past no. um, that possibility just because both of these teams, either the Nuggets look great in game three, and then it was a complete 180 in game four, and just the Trailblazers looked on the entire night. Granted, you know they had a pretty, a pretty sizable lead after the first half, and then they just blew the doors open in the third quarter. So I, I do expect... Game five to be a lot more competitive, though, which will segue into our next segment. So we'll give our predictions for the Tuesday games that we have. So just to kind of give you guys the rundown real quick, we'll start with the Boston and Brooklyn series first, and then we'll move on to the Trail uh, Trailblazers and the Nuggets, and then we'll wrap it up with the Lakers and the Suns. So we have three games for the Tuesday slate of games. Kevin, since I mentioned it first, what do you think game five between the Celtics and the Nets is going to result in? Well, I just want to give a quick shout out. Jason Tatum, 90 points by himself in the last two games. Jason dropped 50 on Friday after we recorded on Thursday night and showed this this is what I do. Like, I'm, I'm fucking here. We're not going to win the series, but yo, y'all not about to sweep me on my floor. And I think that that speaks volume to the type of player that Jason Tatum is and that level of separation between him and a lot of players in his age category. He's up there with the Luka Doncic's under the 25 age. He's, he's just absolutely carving it up. He dropped 40 in a loss in game four. But I think, honestly, all, all jokes aside, game five, Brooklyn's got to take it. They got to close it out. Um, I'm not saying even if Boston comes out, they would find a way to win the series. Kyrie, KD, and Harden scored 104 points combined between the three of them in game four. And I think that speaks enough volume to say, hey, this, this is a wrap. The fact that Boston got their one game, like we said a hundred times, it would take Jason Tatum to drop 50 for them to win a game. He's dropped 90 in two games and he got one win out. That, that, that's enough. I think Boston. I think Boston loses this game handedly. I think that the hot streak that this Brooklyn team is on right now, with all three of their superstars playing really well and meshing, and I think with this little bit of a fan instance that just happened this last game, once again a water bottle was thrown at Kyrie Irving. The fan was escorted, banned from the arena, and arrested and charged with assault um, for throwing that at Kyrie's head. I think that's going to put a little bit of a chip on his shoulder to say, "Yo, I want to put this to bed like right now." Mm-hmm. KD was basically unguardable. James Harden was almost a walking triple-double. I think it's over. I, honestly, Kimba's not playing. I think he had a knee injury that kept him out of game four. I don't know if he's playing in game five. Not that it would make a difference. But, yeah, no, I think I think Boston has done enough this season and, and Brooklyn goes on to the next round. I'm with you 100%. I think Brooklyn wins this game pretty handily. I just don't know how they're going to be able to stop those that big three-headed monster in Brooklyn. One of them Scary. is going to go off, even if two of them don't have necessarily the best game. One of them is going to have a really good game. And honestly, you could have your pick of who you think is going to have a good game. I could think that probably two, if not all three, are going to have 
a pretty sizable impact in game five. I just don't think that the Celtics have enough firepower to match that. It's like you said, Jason can only do so much. It's one guy and he's been playing absolutely spectacular. 40 points in game four, 50 in game three. And the fact they were only to get one game out of Jason pretty much giving everything that he could to get Boston that one win. I just, it, it's too much pressure on one guy. And I just, I think the Nets roll in this one. I think this is going to be probably a 15 to 20 point dub for the Nets. I, I think, I think the Celtics are going to keep it close. I think they're going to try to keep it competitive in the first half, but I think Brooklyn's going to make some second half adjustments. And I think Katie, Kyrie, or James, one of them is going to pop up in the third quarter. I, I just think they're going to, it's going to be an avalanche for Boston. And I just don't think Boston's going to be able to recover from that. And then I think the Nets win this game and they move on to the second round of the playoffs. Yeah, there's, there's not really much else you can say about that series, honestly. Um, Jason Tatum needs some help. I don't know what Boston's going to do in the offseason with Bradley Stevens and Kemba Walker or another superstar of their draft. Neither here nor there. So moving forward, the Nuggets and the Trailblazers series, I'm pretty sure Kyle and I pretty much talked about enough of that in regards to the, the previous game. Now the prediction portion of it, does get a little difficult so i mean kyle i'll 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 pass it on to you because i'm still torn who do you think is coming out on top in game five of this series i'm gonna go with the nuggets on this one i think mike malone's comments about calling his starters quote unquote actually let me paraphrase this i I don't want to say he called them soft but they played soft i think it's gonna light a fire under this team and i think the nuggets are gonna look a lot better than what they said they were in game four and I think while this game is going to be close, I don't think it's going to be a blowout like it was in game four for either team. I think the Nuggets are going to get better performances from Nikola Jokic, from Michael Porter Jr. Don't be surprised if you see Paul Millsat uh, chip in, if you see possibly Aaron Gordon chip in. I think this, I think those comments that Mike Malone made, I think it's going to get this team ready to go for game five. It's like they got something to prove. And stop the momentum that the Trailblazers had from game four and put the pressure back on Portland going back to Portland in game six. And I think the Nuggets win a close one here. I could see this one going possibly like 115 to like 109. That's my prediction. Yeah, no, I agree completely. I think that those comments will light a fire under that young team's ass. I think that's definitely going to put them in a predicament of saying like, hold on a second, like, we ain't soft. Like, we had a bad night. Like, you know what I'm saying? I think Michael Porter and Jokic definitely turning around. I'm calling a triple-double for Nikola Jokic this game. I think he's going to come out very aggressive, maybe 25, 30 points, about 10, 15 rebounds, about maybe like, I don't know, 10, 11 assists. I think he's really going to get involved and, and try to make a statement and really go get his team this W because he knows that they need it going back on their home court for game five. Um, now, on the counter side to that, if Damian Lillard has himself a Damian Lillard night, and the team continues to play well around him. I agree with Kyle. It could be a lot closer, but I do think that the presence of Nikola Jokic and the dominance of his presence will lead the Nuggets to a very close victory as well. So I definitely have Denver going and taking game five. Well said. And then we'll transition to the last game that we have for the Tuesday games, which would be the Lakers going up against the Suns in Phoenix. So Kev, let me get your prediction for game five between the Lakers and the Suns. This is tough, and not that the, 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 the Blazers and the Nuggets game wasn't tough to predict, but I, I, I think I'm, I'm going to go out on the limb here, and I'm going to say LeBron James carries the Lakers to a surprising Game 5 win. We've seen this man carry scrubs to the finals year after year. We've seen him literally dominate this league for the last 10 years, I would say he's relatively healthy right now, excluding whatever ailing ankle injury still uh, persists on his foot. But I think LeBron turns it around. I think he gets the team rallied around him. I think LeBron James goes for, uh, again, another uh, his triple-double. I think he goes for about 25, 10, and 10, 25, 15, and 10. I think that he needs to do this in order for the Lakers to win because if he doesn't produce on every facet of the – every aspect of basketball, like the defensive end, passing, rebounding, and scoring. I don't think the Lakers have a shot. Um, But 
if Braun does have a rough night, or should I say if the team has a rough night around him, don't be surprised if Devin Booker goes out there and drops 30-plus points. Uh, you know, Chris Paul has a double-double and so on and so forth. I think DeAndre Ayton, win or lose, is going to have a huge game because he's going to be just working one-on-one with DeAndre Drummond, excuse me, with Andre Drummond for the majority of the game. I think he has a 25 and 15 night. So um, I got the Lakers winning in game five, but I would not be shocked if LeBron is pretty much, you know, screaming on deaf ears and he's the only one that produces because the supporting cast has been a little bit lackluster this series, to say the least. I'm going to agree with you. I'm going to pick the Lakers on a close one here. I think that LeBron's actually going to be the tone setter in this game. I think he's going to set it right from the start because when I look at this series overall, the Lakers have gotten to some slow starts against the Suns. And I think in this game, I think they realize the the pressure and the severity of this game. And I think they're trying to, I think they'll try to run and gun in the first half to establish a lead and try to hold it throughout the rest of the game. I think LeBron's going to go out there, get 30, 35 and, in this one. I, I fully believe that just because I think he's been rather passive in some of these games. He's made some very clutch be- buckets for the Lakers time and time again. But I think in this one, he's going to be the focal point of the offense. And I think he is going to be the spark that gets the Lakers to a dub. I think they're going to get some decent contributions from some other starters. We may see KCP come back in game five. He did miss game four. So possibly seeing him back in the lineup could make a difference. Also, I want to see what Andre Drummond could produce. He's going to have that one-on-one matchup against DeAndre Ayton. Who's going to win that matchup? I think it's going to be a close one. I think just looking at it on paper, I might get the slight edge to Ayton, but I think Andre Drummond is going to make a sizable impact for the Lakers defensively, and we could see what he could do offensively because he can get some buckets here and there maybe some nice dunks and maybe some layups if the chance, if the chances are there for him. And then when I look at the Suns, look, I think Chris Paul is getting more confidence in his shoulder. I think he's going to go out there and have a very good game. I I'm fully expecting Devin Booker to go out there and produce at least a 25, if not a 30 point game again. And the big key for me is what are the Suns role players going to do? We saw in game four, you saw Jay Crowder really step up in a big way for Phoenix. We saw Mikhail Bridges step up for a big way. We also saw Cameron Payne come off the bench and get 13 points. He looked fantastic. He's actually looked fantastic coming off the bench, even despite Chris Paul dealing with his shoulder injury. With that said, though, I think Phoenix's role players are going to be not as good as they were or not as impactful as they were in game four. And I think the Lakers, I think they're going to force some turnovers here. I think they're going to really ramp up the defensive intensity on Phoenix. And I think Phoenix is going to throw some air passes that the Lakers are going to exploit. And I think they're going to turn those turnovers into baskets. I think this is going to be by far the most competitive game that we've seen so far in this series. And I think the Lakers win a very close one. I'm going to say 104 to 98. Gotta That's take this man Kyle to Vegas, man. This guy's actually out here putting the exact score on the scoreboard. You're a lot better than me because I, I sure shit couldn't do it. I think it's simply just because points have become the tough. Uh, points have been tough to come by in this series so far. I actually think Good both defensive defense, series. I think this series has been very defensive, and I think a lot of people may have been expecting it to be the other way around, just because you have prolific scores on both sides of the ball. You got LeBron James, Anthony Davis. And then with Phoenix, you got Chris Paul, DeAndre Ayton, and Devin Booker. They can all score. And it's the one thing that I've seen in the series. Shooting has actually been kind of a struggle. Both of these teams haven't really shot the best um, in any of these games. But I think you're going to see kind of more of the same. I think it would be a struggle to really see these teams really get to like 45% shooting altogether. So... Granted, it's just one man's take, but I think it's going to be a very competitive game, and I think it's possibly going to be the best game that we see in this series. Yeah, more than likely. I, w- I would say this this game five is going to be 100%. Yo, this is it. Like, this is the game to watch. This is the game to pay attention to, and for the right reasons. The, the Suns know without Anthony Davis on the floor, this is their opportunity to strike and win at home. 
try to, you know, take a lead in this series and even a, a, a limited Anthony Davis, potentially, if he does play in game six, once again, that is still an advantage in Phoenix's portion because they are not healthy. And that is their opportunity to go out there and win. Granted, it does suck that it is on the, the, the injury of a, of a star player, but it is the postseason injuries happen and Phoenix needs to know to quote Kyle from the previous series prediction, Phoenix smells blood. They need to go dominate. They need to capitalize on this injury and they need to go and try to advance the next, the next series. Fair enough. Speaking of blood in the water, Kevin, I'm going to let you have your moment here. Um, Dallas has not looked rather impressive in the last two home games that they played. They were up 2-0 in the series going into game three at home, and they proceeded to lose back-to-back home games against the Clippers, and the Clippers in game four really did put it on the Mavs. They had a 25-point win in Dallas. Kawhi Leonard looked absolutely spectacular. Paul George looked great as well, and then they were able to get some key contributions from Marcus Morris and Reggie Jackson as well. So, Kev, let me just get your overall opinion on the status of this Clippers NAF series. Uh, right before I do that, the Wizards are about to upset the Sixers. Uh, the Wizards are up by six with 21 seconds to go. Uh, Russell Westbrook and Bradley Beal have found a way to win this game. Joel Embiid, granted, did get hurt and did exit the game. He did not come back. But it seems that Washington has found a way to survive for another game. Yep. Now, getting into this abomination of a, of, of a series, um, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be blunt. I'm going to be very honest, and I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to tell you right now from a Mavericks fan, without any negativity, with blunt, brutal honesty, this series is over. Our opportunity to win this series was in Game 3 on Friday. Luca had 44, 9, and 9. And nobody backed him up. Mm-hmm. KP had nine points. We lost by 10 on our home floor. Kawhi Leonard popped off. PG popped off. Reggie Jackson popped off. And Marcus Morris popped off. Granted, Kyle and I both predicted the Clippers to win this game. And we predicted the role players to step up for the Clippers, which is exactly what happened. They had over 60 points combined before the fourth even started I'm t- in reference to Kawhi and Paul George. But the fact that we kept that game close all the way up until midway through the fourth was amazing, but at the same time frustrating because the team just did not produce and we absolutely shit the bed when it mattered most between shot selection and free throws. Once again, Luka Doncic shooting under 45% from the free throw line this series. Absolutely, completely, positively unacceptable. If you're that good, and you take as many jump shots as you do throughout a game. You're telling me you cannot sit and look at the free throw. Uh, uh, the fr- you can't sit at the free throw line and look at the basket and tell me, bro, ain't no shot contest. I don't got to step back. I don't have to shoot off balance. It's just me in the rim. And you just can't do it in the postseason. Unacceptable. That's game three. Last night, watching that game, as a Mavericks fan, I knew within the first five minutes this game was over by the lack of effort from the team as a whole. Literally sitting here and watching Porzingis go three for three or three or four from the field to start the game. And my girlfriend was getting excited and whatnot. She's like, okay, he's finally doing something. I said, yo, this game's over. Five minutes into the game, I said, this this game is over. I'm talking, we're having people shoot jump shots as we have been all season, as, excuse me, as we have been all series. Like I told Kyle, We've been getting a little overconfident with the with with the ability with the uh, recent hot streak of shooting the three ball. At one point in the third quarter, we were four of twenty eight from the three. I was like under seventeen percent. Just saying, that was in the third quarter. Oof. I didn't watch anything past the third quarter because I was I was fed up. I checked out. I was done. I didn't want to give myself another migraine. I went to sleep. I was over it. I I, I I'm sitting here and I'm watching. I can't remember who it was. Somebody. I, I think it was Tim Hardaway Jr. He took. He penetrated into the lane, and he threw a floater up, and our entire offense was outside the three-point line. Kristaps Porzingis is seven foot three, running at five, not near the rim. Maxi Kleba sitting in the corner. Nobody's, nobody's chasing the rebound. So what do the Clippers proceed to, uh, proceed to do? They get, a, they get a rebound, an outlet pass. We have to foul because we're fucking short-staffed on the other end because we didn't want to hustle back 
after the miss. So the, the four of you are outside the perimeter with a head start on defense, and we still have to foul because we're not getting back. No effort, no urgency, and absolutely no offense outside of Luka Doncic. Mind you, the man has a neck strain that has clearly visibly affected him this entire game. He still goes out there and plays 36 minutes and is 9 of 24 from the field with 19 points, six boards and six assists. You're telling me a man basically with one arm has to go and lead the team in scoring? Unacceptable. Complete bullshit. I've had enough of this team just, oh, well, uh, the ball is too far. Or like, oh, the Clippers are too big down low. Or, oh, man, the ball just, you know, it just, it just got out of my hands, man. No, we have four, basically four seven-footers on this team. And none of them are averaging anything above five rebounds a game. Luka Doncic is the leading rebounder in this series in, in regards to the Mavericks. Kristaps is 7-3. Boban got some minutes last night. He's 7-4. We have Willie Colley Stein at 7 feet. Nobody is doing anything on the rebounding issue. We're turning the ball over and we're throwing up garbage. Listen, in my, in my opinion, as an, as an NBA fan, as a basketball fan, if shots ain't falling, if you just can't hit a jump shot, what's the next logical step in the sport of basketball to do? If I can't shoot, Kyle, I'm asking you, literally, if, you're, if you just can't shoot, what, what's the next step of offense? I pass it to somebody who can't shoot. Pass it to someone who can't shoot, or you take it to the rack and go to the free throw line. But instead, this team decided to say, you know what? Fuck it. We're going to keep throwing garbage up at the rim. And do you want to know what our final percentage was from three? We were five of fucking 30. 16.7% from the three-point line. 63.6% from the free throw line. We were 34.8% shooting as a team we threw up garbage we put no effort on the defensive end to try to stop or halt or make any type of a difference to Paul George or Kawhi Leonard or anybody else the Clippers must be shooting upwards of 70 percent in the corner of this series on both sides of the court and on both sides of the floor because I don't know what it is after we double Kawhi or Paul or we collapse on somebody driving into the lane. We do not know how to defensively rotate into the corner because Marcus Morris literally might be shooting hundred percent from the three in the corner. I, I, I Reggie Jackson, I, I, everybody, everybody is lights out in the corner, but you might as well just put a, a, a circle right there that says, yo, they're going to end up here. I need someone to stand here. Cause that's where they've been shooting. And any run we went on ended with a, a, a corner three by the Clippers. Paul George did not have the greatest game, and he was, I believe, 6 of 16, but he found a way to squeak out 20 points. Everybody on this Clippers roster, minus people on the bench, were plus. Like, they were a, they were, they were a, a positive plus minus. Everybody. Kawhi Leonard and everybody else on this team just said, you know what? If they're not going to hustle, fuck it. Why not? We're just going to dominate. They beat us by 25 on our home court. It's absolutely done. I'm over it. I've been saying this since 2011 as a Mavericks fan. We have not had a traditional big since Tyson Chandler was on this team. And then we got him back after he left the Knicks. And then we let him go again. We're literally sitting here and we're, we're promoting, stretching the floor and shooting bigs and whatnot. Chris Porzingis is great when he's healthy but I'm tired of seeing him sit around the perimeter when I need you to put your back to the basket. There was an instance where he was trying to back down. I don't know if it was Marcus Morris or Rajon Rondo, and he wasn't moving them. Bolvan Marjanovic, 7'4", probably 250, 60 pounds. I don't know. The man's massive. He's not a human being. He was switched on Paul George on a pick and roll situation where he obviously has five inches, maybe 100 fucking pounds. Paul George was moving him out of the post. We're soft. We are absolutely soft. Everybody that plays the five on the Mavericks is soft. Dwight Powell coming off the bench. I don't know why. You cannot guard anybody. You're not a good shooter. You're literally useful for the pick and roll alley-oop. Chris Stapps Porzingis barely plays any defense, gets no rebounds. He's averaging under five rebounds a game this whole series, and you're 7'3". You're taller than their tallest player and you can't get rebounds. Luka Doncic is playing with one arm, and he's out-rebounding you. Trey Burke played in this game. No idea why. Zero idea. He hasn't played this whole series. Nine minutes, 0 for 4. Willie Colley-Stein, five minutes, zero points. Dwight Powell, 
Granted, he did score four minutes. He's still useless. I don't understand. And I'm going to circle on one final point. The Mavericks trading for J.J. Redick and Melly was the stupidest trade in the world for situations like this. Well, we could have had Wes Oweyawu, or however you pronounce his last name, and James Johnson, who are both acquired by Dallas for their defensive intensity. And we traded for J.J. Redick, who hasn't played a game in over two weeks. We traded for a hurt 34, 35-year-old J.J. Redick who hasn't played more than seven or eight games for this team. Why? Why did we, tra- we, we, we wanted to get grittier on defense this offseason. We wanted to get tougher. So you go and you add a shooter who's 30 plus years old and you go and add Melly, who I, I, I do like. I, I see that he does hustle and he, you know, he does run down loose balls and he does put up decent shots and good looks. They're just not falling for him. He's from Italy. But we traded two gritty veteran defenders in this league for garbage. Don Nelson made a stupid decision to go out there and trade for people who aren't even on the fucking court and we're not putting in any effort on on, on the rebounding aspect of this game. I've literally had enough. We had 20 fouls as a team yesterday because we put in no effort. Guys, I wish I was kidding. If you didn't see this game, there were times where rebounds would bounce right to the Clippers player. They'd get on a break and we'd be like, yo, we're not there. We got a foul. Like, that's, that's on me. No hustle, no grit, no determination. This game will end in Dallas with a blowout from the Clippers. I've, I've, I, I cannot say enough. If we don't step this game up, if we don't put any kind of change into this lineup, or not this lineup, this mentality of this basketball team, I think we, we have to blow it up. We have to blow it I'm not happy with anybody on this team. Nobody is safe from my wrath. That is not Luka Doncic because he's doing everything. And even at that, this man needs to fucking shoot better from the free throw line. So I can't even say he's 100% safe from my wrath. Because everybody on this team needs to understand this is a team cohesive unit. This is a team sport. One guy can't do it by himself. I don't even think I need to add to any of that. I'm not going to be as pessimistic as you are in saying that this series is just quote unquote over. But the Clippers are on a roll right now. And I think for game five, they look to be the favorite in my opinion for game five. That's just kind of how I see it. Um, It's kind of like I said, with some of the predictions that we made last week, uh, the the Mavs three ball was going to cool off at some point. And we have seen that drastically happen really in game four. That's where it stood out to me. And if the Mavs aren't going to be able to knock down the three point shots, I I think this Clippers team is well equipped to be a, a battered Dallas team right now. So, I think you made a very valid point about game three. I think that was the game that you guys needed to get because going up 3-0 in that series would have been pretty much lights out for the Clippers. But the Clippers fought back. And not only did they fight back in game three, they just absolutely blew the doors off of you guys in game four. So, yeah, the Mavs are in some trouble right now. And there's some genuine trouble because, man, being up 2-0 in the series and possibly they could lose four straight if they're not careful. That that is that is debilitating to a team. So I don't know where the shoot is going to come from, but they got to get some guys to step out outside of Luca. They got to have Tim Hardaway step up, Jalen Brunson step up, Dorian Finney Smith. But Dorian's been ice cold since game one. Ice yeah. frigid cold. So and it's 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 absolutely ridiculous. It, I just, it, you got to do. You got to give credit where credit is due. The Clippers have been playing outstanding basketball the last two games. They, they have, have been. They've been and playing it's a lot No better. thanks to Tyron Lue. It's because Kawhi Leonard and Paul George are literally sitting here saying, "Bro, are they not going to double? Are they really going to let me come up the floor? Oh, they're just going to give me open. Ch- oh, okay, okay, okay. Like and, they, we're not we're not helping them. And Reggie Jackson off the bench has been outstanding. He almost kind of looks like what he used to do for freaking OKC back when they had Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook. Granted, so, he was 5 of 12 from the field, but he's putting up enough points to show still, like, yo, don't leave me decent? open. Don't so decent? Me open. It's better than free. Man, I'm just, I can't. I can't even watch Undisputed because I know C- C- Skip Bayless is just getting out of pocket. I don't even, I don't even want to watch him. Oh, because about all of his uh, takes about the Clippers? Yeah, he's a Clippers fan out of nowhere, but whatever. Oh, he's a Kawhi guy. He's always been down for Kawhi. Yeah. 
yeah, I know. Wherever so he, is Max wherever Kellerman. he, wherever he goes, Skip's gonna be right there with him. So. Yeah. Well, it is what it is. Once, once clip, what clip? Once Skip made the prediction that Dallas, or so, I forgot, he said something about Dallas dominating after Game Two. I knew for a fact this series was over because Skip. For those of you that are unaware, whenever Skip says a team's going to win, the opposite always happens. It literally never fails. So that's enough of my rant. Um, I've had enough. I actually have given myself a migraine, which is very unfortunate for me. Um, but, yeah. So next segment, please. <laughs> I believe this is the final segment of the episode. I am, we're going to talk a little bit about the New York Knicks. And <sighs> Another heartbreak. Look, the, the last episode that we had, I believe Atlanta was up two to one after they won game three. Might be wrong on that. You might have to check me on that. But currently as it stands, uh, the Atlanta Hawks are up 3-1 against the New York Knicks as both teams go back to the Garden for game five. Kev, I'm just going to be honest here. Do you think the Knicks are done being down 3-1 against Atlanta? If I'm being completely honest... I'm trying to be optimistic about this team because I know how gritty they can be defensively. I do think it is over. I think this is too much of a deficit to overcome. I think that Atlanta has figured out New York's defense and New York's role players, like they're significant, they're 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 focal points. And Julius Randle and RJ Barrett have not been able to do enough. Uh, granted, RJ did drop uh, a series high for him at 21 points this last game. But Julius's inefficiencies and his turning over the basketball have been ridiculous. Um, I think that this series does end in New York. I think Atlanta takes it in five, unfortunately. Unless New York finds a way to muster up some confidence, it's, it's, it's getting really bad. I mean, the fact that they were relying on a 32-year-old point guard to be their leading scorer for the majority of the series and Derrick Rose did speak volume to me. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I, I do think this series is over, unfortunately. The one thing that's really surprised me is the Knicks defense. And they've been getting exposed. In game three, they gave up 105. In game four, they gave up over 110. And Trey Young, in his first playoff series, has looked absolutely spectacular. Even in game three, granted, he only scored 21 points, but he had 14 assists to go along with that. And when I look up and down this roster, the Hawks have been spectacular. Clint Capella's chipping in. He's having a great game offensively and defensively just overall in this series. We finally got to see a little bit of the role players of the Hawks step up a little bit. You had DeAndre Hunter have some big moments in game three. You had John Collins also step up as well in spurts in the last two games in Atlanta. And then even Gallinari has had some moments to go along with that as well. I know specifically in, in game, I believe it was game four. Game four, he had a really good game. And Bogdanovich 21. as well. Yeah, Bogdanovich had Bogdanovich a game. Bogdanovich only had 12. I'm talking about game. In Bogdanovich's game case, three. it was game three. He, he definitely had a nice little hot streak yeah. in game three. I just don't know how the Knicks are going to be able to combat Atlanta's defense. I really thought the, the Knicks would be able to score against – this defense that Atlanta has, but buckets have been tough to come by. I mean, they've been getting decent production from Derrick Rose. I mean, Derrick Rose in game three, he dropped 30 points. But you look at the rest of the roster, Julius Randle only had 14. Reggie Bullock had 11. And then I think their, their leading scorer outside of Derrick Rose and Julius Randle was Nerlens Noel. He had 12. They're just not getting enough production. And R.J. Barrett, you know, granted, I know he's still young, but he has been he's been really inconsistent in this series. Game three, he drops seven points. Granted, he had a better game in game four, dropped over 20, but you're going to need better consistency for him moving forward if the Knicks want to survive in this series. And I just, I'm not optimistic here about the Knicks. I'm really concerned about the Knicks being able to salvage this series. There's a very good chance that Atlanta goes in there and I'm not going to say beat the brakes off of the, the Knicks, but I think if the Knicks are just inconsistent from shooting uh, from the field, I think the Hawks could win by 10, 15 plus in this game. So yeah, I, I, I would not put it, I would not put it, I don't think it's going to be, I don't think it's going to be like a 20 point loss for the, the, 
for the uh, for the Knicks here. I'm not expecting that. But if this is inconsistency continues from the Knicks, and you see Trey hooping the, the way that he's been playing, you see Bogdanovich knocking down threes. Gallinari was really hot in, in game three, or excuse me, game four. It could be a wrap. And man, I know Trey was kind of giving it to the fans in the Garden at certain points when those first two games took place in New York. He's going to give it to him a whole nother. He's going to give it to him in a whole new way in Game Five if the Hawks get on a roll here. The Hawks have looked the loss. The Hawks have really looked like the better team from beginning to end in this series. A hundred percent. It's I, I truthfully and honestly think that it's unfortunate to say it, but it, I think it's mainly behind the uh, inability of Julius Randle to get it going. Yeah. I think he's got to kind of let go of that. Yo, I'm the guy on this team. It's there's a lot of isolation instances. He has five turnovers. He had five turnovers. He had five fouls. He had one flagrant foul in the last game. Julius Randle needs to understand that, you know, this isn't the regular season anymore. You can't just bring the ball up, you know, when you guys are down 15, you know, get an and one and, and get it going. You know, you're, you're, you're in the postseason. A lot of your plays, a lot of, a lot of your actions do carry and like trickle down and affect the rest of the team. I mean, like I said, just, this is great. Again, this is his best game that he's had all series with 23, 10 and seven, but the five turnovers really is what, 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 what uh, draws my attention. You know what I mean? Alec Burks, he had he was four of 12 from the field. Uh, R.J. Barrett, eight of 15. He was good. Uh, Derek Rose was efficient as well. Uh, Reggie Bullock, all of four from the field, 34 minutes, uh, negative mm-hmm. 16 on the plus minus uh, score. The Knicks are just not getting it done. They are their own worst enemy in regards to shot selection, and they are not they have not been able to be that defensive anchor of a team that they've been all season. And Trey Young's been carving it up. Ever since you said, you know, I'll see you guys in the A, the man was 2-0 and in Atlanta and just absolutely obliterated the Knicks. And he was 4-14 from the three-point line. So, I mean, he didn't really kill them like that. But he did have 27 points. Yeah. The Knicks are their own worst enemy. And, it, you know, people have got to step up. If Kevin Knox and Norland's the well and, and all these people are going to touch the floor, everybody's got to produce. Everyone's got to put points on the board. You know, if one guy isn't scoring or if one guy's turning the ball over, someone's got to step up. First and foremost, you got to get the ball out of Trey Young's hands. If Trey's got the ball, more than likely, it's either going to be a point or he's dishing it out to somebody that's open. So I don't know if you double. I don't know if you try to start Nil, Nil Takina at the shooting guard and try to get him off of a funk. I know that's stupid, but I'm just saying I'm trying to think of ways to maybe stop Trey. So, yeah, no, it's, 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 it's sadly unfortunate. I really do believe that this series is over. The Knicks had an incredible season. The Knicks just do not look like the fourth-seeded team that they have been all year, and I think Atlanta's got their number. So I think it is what it is. I think Atlanta moves on come, uh, come Tuesday night. Yeah. It, it's been a great ride. Granted, I'm sitting here saying, like, basically the next season is, is over. That's kind of like what I'm projecting, even though I think it's a little bit premature to say because game five hasn't happened yet. But I just think, like you said, Atlanta has their number. And they haven't really been able to find a way to slow down Trey. And Trey really is kind of the, the energizer bunny that gets this team going. So Big time. If you take him out of the equation, if you're able to limit him in a certain way, I think it gives the Knicks a chance, but they have not given me any sort of reason to really think that they can. And he's been but cooking. It's, cra- it's, it's crazy because he was 9 of 21 from the field. So, I mean, the Knicks did something to halt him. Obviously, he missed 10 threes, so that's saying something. But like you had said when you made your point, a lot of the Hawks outside of Trey Young stepped up as well. So... The Knicks don't find a way to alter Trey's shots and keep him on the offhand. I don't think this series, you know, I don't think the series goes past the fifth game. So it's really unfortunate. But who knows? Who knows? The Knicks could find a way to rally back in game five. And then in game six, you know, could the Knicks try to upset the Hawks back in Atlanta if it gets back, um, if they are able to get a win? In game six, granted right, they have to win game five first, but you never know. You never know. So yeah, it's the NBA. Not, so not to really send out a lot of false hope, but you know, a lot can happen. Granted, right, three one comebacks are not common in the NBA. We've seen a couple here and there, but they're few and far between. 
big facts, big facts. But other than that, um, that's all I got. Kyle, um, you have anything for the audience? You have anything for the guys? No, that's all I got. I think all the topics we hit, I think we knocked them out of the park, man. Yeah. Uh, granted, as we always say, guys, thank you so much for all the support. We're at 162 subscribers. Um, we have realized what we're doing and breaking up these videos into a little bit of a smaller segments and kind of separating them out so they're not as dragged out. Uh, it's a little bit easier for the audience, for you guys to uh, find interests, find things that you do want to watch and listen to. So we really do appreciate all the support that we've been getting over the last couple of weeks. Um, and as, as always, guys, if you don't already follow, if you don't already, you know, if you aren't already subscribed, please click the subscribe button, turn your notifications on for whenever we do drop videos and content. We're going to be here every day, or excuse me, every every week. We're going to be putting two to three episodes out here, especially while the playoffs are going on. We're going to do our best to give you guys the best content as we always do. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you guys have done for us. I couldn't have said it any better. Um, just to kind of reiterate Kevin's point, just we appreciate the support wherever we can get it, whether it's you listening to the podcast or watching our YouTube videos. We definitely appreciate it. Um, definitely expect more NBA content to come out later this week. Uh, we'll definitely be getting into the the last couple games of these series in the Eastern and Western Conference Finals. And then, Kev, we're going to be gearing up for the second round of the playoffs. Second round is coming. I can't believe the first round's already almost over. Granted, again, you know, the, uh, the Western Conference, every series that isn't the Utah and Memphis series is tied 2-2. Uh, Washington survived, so they avoided the sweep. But other than that, the first round was great. It, it, it has been great, still is great. And uh, I'm just excited that basketball postseason is carrying the legacy that it always has since we've been alive and before that. Great basketball games. Everything's entertaining. And I, I, I couldn't be happier this is going on. Exactly. But with that said, that'll wrap it up from here, you guys. Once again, we just want to extend the appreciation that – we pretty much say every episode, we definitely appreciate you guys supporting the podcast in any way, shape, or form. And we will see you guys later this week. Later, everybody.